today we're looking for the largest witch hazel tree in Connecticut. All right, so we got about two miles of walking on the trail here, and then the witch hazel I'm looking for is actually off the trail, so we're gonna have to do some bushwhacking for a couple hundred feet. Hey, quick stop at this big old maple tree here because this maple tree can actually tell you quite a bit about the land we're on. Uh, for example, the fact that it's so big uh, can tell you that this was pasture land because back in the day, uh, whenever there was pasture in an area, farmers would oftentimes uh, leave a single big giant tree on the perimeter of the pasture in order to provide shade for the animals. Uh, that's what this one is. You can tell not only because of the size, but also because the branches are growing outwards like this instead of upwards, which means when the tree was growing, there wasn't a lot of competition from other trees around it for sunlight. These are commonly called lone wolf trees. Used to be a cobblestone road right here. You can see all, all these were intentionally placed. Run along this stone wall here. All right, check it. We got to the top of this hill we're climbing up and it's power lines. There was a struggle here. There may have been a tussle. Hear that buzz? No, don't. You know what kind of rock this is? Oh, damn, that's a great specimen of levorite. Leverite? Yeah, it's uh, it's called Leverite because you leave it right there. All right, we're approaching where we're gonna have to get off the trail in a minute now, so getting ready to pound it through those woods. All right, here's the trail. We're as close as we can get on the trail, so time to do a little bushwhacking. Hey, I see like a tag dangling on a tree. Oh, we found it. Damn. Damn, well, sorry for the disappointment. I totally thought this tree would be blooming. Hey, check it out though. Not all is lost because that witch hazel, it looks like is actually a part of a grove of other smaller witch hazels. And some of the smaller ones over here are starting to bloom. See that? There we go. Looking great. There we go. That's some bloom. This is definitely something I can show you at least. So not a total fake out. These are not going to ever become like super, uh, super prominent blooms like the ones you normally see in, in gardens. Right. Uh, I guess I can come back into the winter because uh, witch hazels actually bloom very late in the fall and into the winter too, typically somewhere between October and December. Uh, but I've read that some varieties can even wait till way out further than that. Uh, this is why you might have heard of this tree as a winter bloom. I'm not sure what particular type of witch hazel variety this is. I'm guessing though that because it's out here and not in someone's garden, that it's probably the common witch hazel or Virginia 
or American witch hazel, all means the same thing, uh, which is native to North America and the one you'd find out in the wild here in Connecticut. Most other varieties you'd find in gardens and stuff are gonna be imports. But this guy is uh, super popular as a decorative tree, a garden tree, a yard tree, whatever, for its unique blooming schedule and beauty, but also because it's super low maintenance and very resistant to pests and disease. Uh, this tree grows all over the eastern side of the U.S., pretty much from Maine to Florida and then back out into the Midwest. There's even some local varieties along the way too, like over in the Ozark Mountains in the Missouri-Arkansas region, they have their own uh, little subspecies. Uh, and this particular witch hazel is quite giant. An average witch hazel doesn't really get much bigger than 20 feet tall, but this one is way over that for sure. Uh, and then as I'm sure a lot of you know, this tree has a ton of history behind it as a sort of medicinal or spiritual plant. Uh, for one cool example, Native Americans used the branches as dowsing rods for underground water, which was a practice that was eventually picked up by European colonists and eventually even exported back out to Europe. And of course, the medicinal and cosmetic purposes of the tree are are still in practice today, mostly via witch hazel extract. People use this as an aftershave to treat insect bites, to moisturize the skin, to treat sunburn, to guard against acne, all sorts of stuff. Uh, I guess it's the bark and roots of the tree that create the extract. In fact, I even read that commercial production and sale of witch hazel extract was started not too far from here uh, by a guy named Dr. Charles Hawes. He apparently learned that distilling the plant's twigs created a high volume of the extract, and using this production method, he eventually got what he referred to as Hawes extract, sold in a pharmacy in 1846. But that was small potatoes compared to a man named Thomas Newton Dickinson Sr.'s production of the witch hazel extract a couple decades later. Uh, Dickinson Sr. is the one normally credited with really getting the product off the ground. Uh, he ended up getting it mass produced in a number of factories across Eastern CT, uh, setting the groundwork for its still very common use today. All right, uh, that's all I got for you guys today on the American Witch Hazel. Sorry I couldn't show you it in its full bloom. Uh, we actually just looked it up on our phones and found out that the American Witch Hazel peaks its bloom in the fall season I was talking about earlier. So might have to come back one day. For now, see you next time.